So remember back to my last video where I said, so remember back to my first video where I said that I was too cool for 3D, 3D engines, engines or, or languages, languages with classes, classes and garbage, garbage collection, collection namespaces, and things, and things you don't, don't really need. need. And then I said, yeah, well, I've thought some more about it since then. And, you know, I've humbled a bit and decided I'm just too good for operating systems at this point, too. Well, since building my own operating system, I've had even more time to consider and come to the conclusion that my own OS simply isn't good enough. The only way I will allow my code to run now is on the pinnacle of all creation. My own creation. A completely custom-built computer. Now, you might be asking, what exactly does this mean? Are we going to hop on PC Part Picker and throw together an absolute beast of a PC with an AMD Ryzen 9 5900X, a GeForce RTX 380 Ti, 128 gigs of RAM, and a power supply that gets like 50 miles per gallon? Not quite. We're going to be going a little more old school. Nope. No, nope, even older school. Nope. Even older. There we go. The computer that I'll be designing is roughly equivalent to the computing power in this bad boy, the PDP-8, straight out of 1965. Oh, yeah, and it's gonna run Pong, not any sort of important science work or something that was done on a PDP-8. So it'll sort of kind of be this PDP-8 crossed with an Intel 8008, crossed with an old school Pong machine, crossed with whatever poor design decisions I make along the way. So with all that out of the way, let's get started. The first step along any mini computer designer's journey is to determine the architecture of the machine, basically defining how the whole thing works, and in our case that means specking out this 1960s grade workhorse of a machine with a data width of 8 bits and a 16-bit address bus for an unbelievable maximum of 64 kilobytes of memory. This also means we have to decide exactly what the computer needs to be able to do, or the instruction set. Now this isn't going to be anything like your old 386 you have out collecting dust in the garage, no. We don't have time for such a complex architecture. For the JDH8, we're rolling with only 16 unique instructions. A few to move data around in registers and memory, those being the load word, store word, and move word instructions. A couple for device communication, in byte or in B, and out byte or out B. Then we have our two standard stack manipulation operations, push and pop. And the rest are arithmetic operations, including add, add with carry, bitwise, and or and nor, compare, and subtract with borrow. The final two were this special load address or LDA instruction which takes two bytes into the h &L registers, and finally the all important jump if not zero or J and Z instruction that makes this baby turn complete. We've also got eight whole general purpose 8-bit registers to play with that store temporary data for the computer, including the F register for arithmetic flags, the h &L registers for an indirect 16-bit memory address, and then A, B, C, D, and Z for the rest of our data. Next up, we've got the memory layout. So from hex zero to hex FFFF, or the end of our 64K of address space, we have 16 kilobytes of read-only memory, or ROM, from hex zero to hex 8,000, eight kilobytes of banked memory, which can be swapped in and out by the memory bank register. This is kind of an old school cheat that lets us access more than 64 kilobytes of memory. Then eight kilobytes of general purpose dedicated, dedicated RAM. Whammed. This is just your standard stuff. Read, write, nothing special. And at the top of said RAM, we have three important memory mapped 16-bit registers. The memory bank or MB register, which tracks the current memory bank. The stack pointer or SP register, which tracks the current stack location. And the program counter or PC register, which tracks the location of the current instruction and can be modified by the jump if not zero instruction. Also specified here in the design doc is to have the status register mapped as a device which contains information about the current state of the computer, like whether it's on and or halted. You can also see me write a lot about interrupts in the design doc here, but little did I know at this point that I would later scrap the idea because interrupt just made things too complicated. Anyway though, that's the whole thing. Now, you might be thinking that this computer can't actually do a lot with just those 16 instructions, and that would be correct, but we can start combining more of these basic operations into larger operations to express all of the computational logic we could want at least as well as any old Intel processor. And as part of this combining, you can see me here writing some macros, basically letting us later on express some of these complex operations as one instruction instead of a series of instructions.
But anyways, once the design doc is in order and we have some of the basic macros down, the first piece of software to really write is the emulator. Basically one big simulator for this custom computer. Oh, and of course it's going to be written in our old friend Mr. C here. And this is actually where the architecture really shines. If a computer can only do 16 things, well, it's kind of easy to just slap all of those operations in a switch statement, wrap that in some kind of infinite loop, and let the emulator run free. Now, normally in my videos, I would put a demo in here, but what do we really have to demo? There's no software written for this thing to emulate. As this is a totally custom computer, any software that runs on this architecture has to be written totally from scratch, including the software that takes our software to make it into software that can run on our custom hardware. This is also known as an assembler, and it's the next thing we need to build. See, to test out our emulator, I could just hand compile some assembly code into hexadecimal, poke it into memory, point the emulator to it, and tell it to run, but this process doesn't really scale, especially if we want Pong running on this thing eventually. So, time to write the assembler. Now, I've never actually written an assembler before, so I was kind of at a loss for where to start, but there's one thing I know about how compilers work, which are generally much more complicated than assemblers, but based on the same principles. First, you take your code, then you do some lexical analysis, then you parse it, then you generate code. So the first step here is to write a lexer, which takes our assembly code, tokenizes it, and converts it to a non-string representation. Now, most programming forms would probably tell you if you asked, hey, how do I write a lexer? That this lexing thing is a solved problem and you should probably use a lexical analyzer generator. Not cool in my book though, we are rolling our own. So here you can see the first parts of the lexer going down. And I also rapidly came to regret this decision. Turns out if it's been a while since you've done a lot of string manipulation in C, you tend to make dumb mistakes quite often. Sometimes ones that cost you a few seconds and sometimes a few hours. But anyway, once the lexer was spitting out the right tokens, I could move on to parsing or understanding the semantics of the code. Normally a compiler would have a fancy recursive descent parser, also done by a parser generator, but again, I was rolling my own and thankfully we don't need anything too complicated. Basically all the parser needs to do here is read directives like define, org, include, and data directives, keep track of labels, and expand macros. Oh, and I also got to solve the classic programming homework problem of implementing a calculator in here. Basically, in the assembler, anything you throw between two parentheses gets treated like a mathematical operation and calculated out as such. One caveat though, I was a little too lazy to implement any operator precedents, so programmer beware. These two expressions mean very different things in the assembler. And remember those macros that I wrote a few minutes ago in the design doc? No way we were going to get far writing any software without those, so the next task up was to work in support for those in the assembler. A macro is basically defined by its label, its arguments, which are prefixed by this percent sign and that can be a register, an immediate, an address, or a register or immediate. And then it basically just contains all of this macro text, which is what gets pasted into where the macro is invoked. So getting these into the assembler means basically just taking the macro definition, pasting in the arguments, and then pasting that into the final assembly code. This way, even though our program can contain more complex operations and macros, everything ends up as those 16 simple instructions in the end. After the bulk of the work here was done, conveniently ignoring testing and bug fixing along the way, it was time to get all of the 16 possible operations in there and write the code that actually takes the final macro expanded assembly code and generates the binary data that gets loaded into the computer and executed. This just follows along with the instruction encoding defined in the design doc and is pretty straightforward. So once those operations were in there, it was finally time to test. Now, I'm not usually one for tests if you can tell by the complete lack thereof of my previous projects, but the complexity of this project kind of warranted some testing, I think, so I threw together a quick program that will take a set of assembly programs, assemble them, run the output of the assembler through the emulator, and then go check to make sure that the output is correct. This way, we have full end-to-end -end testing of both the emulator and the assembler at the same time. So I went through, wrote some tests, found some bugs, fixed some bugs, wrote some more tests, found some more bugs, fixed some more bugs, you, you get how it goes. Standard software developer things here, really. After not too long, though, I had a beautiful passing test suite for both the assembler and the emulator. 
Oh, and it was also around here that I dug deep into my brain, pulled out my knowledge of VimScript, and wrote a quick syntax highlighting file for the custom assembly language. Much better on the eyes this way, I think. And with that, we have our architecture, our emulator, our assembler, and most importantly, our syntax highlighting. So what's next on our journey to computational independence is, well, there's only one thing we can do, the circuit. So hold onto your USB cables and get ready to watch hours go by in seconds. Jeez, I know that was like a minute of video, but god damn you guys are lucky you didn't see that stuff in real time. Like 20 plus hours of circuit building. And the worst part? The, the program I was using there, Logisim, doesn't have a dark theme, so by the end of these few days my eyes were practically melted out of my skull. But anyway, you can see in the background here the first version of the circuit I got working. It's constructed entirely out of logic gates, which do basic boolean logic such as AND, OR, NOR, etc. It uses registers for storing temporary data, buffers for managing the data and address buses, and RAM and ROM chips for bulk data storage. And yeah, it definitely looks a little confusing, but it is sectioned nicely off into a few easier to understand pieces that all perform a distinct function for the computer. So for a quick little tour, first we have the registers, which are those 8-bit A, B, C, D, L, H, Z, and F values that I mentioned earlier. The auxiliary registers, like the program counter, stack pointer, and memory bank register. Yeah, the circuitry here is a little messy since these registers are addressed through memory and don't behave like regular registers. Then we have the address logic up here to determine whether we should be addressing RAM or ROM and the RAM and ROM chips over here. Then the registers containing the current operation the computer is performing. Then the status register and the current I.O. port register and some messy circuitry which controls how many bytes to load for the current instruction over here on the right. And over here we have the ALU or arithmetic logic unit, which does, well, as it says on the box, all of the arithmetic operations in the computer, like adding, subtracting, and bitwise operations. Then there's some more random logic kind of scattered throughout. And finally, the microcode, which drives all the control lines for the computer. This is really the brain of the machine. The microcode is basically a smaller instruction set where each word or two bytes of microcode corresponds to having some of these control lines low or high for the computer and the control lines control, well, everything. Which register to select, whether or not to write to memory, if the computer should load some value to or from the ALU, every part of the computer is connected with these control lines. Also, finally, yes, electrical engineers, I know Logisim is probably bad, but I have literally zero formal education in digital electronics and really didn't want to learn how to use professional software, let alone VHDL or some other unholy witchcraft language like that. So please keep that in mind before you write a comment flaming me for using some outdated educational tool for this project. Anyway though, I thought after this first build, the circuit was a little messy, so I went through and cleaned it up, tested it out, found some bugs, fixed some bugs, then tested it out some more and rewired it one more time and gave it the final test. The program here, one of the test programs I wrote for the emulator and assembler, computes the 8th Fibonacci number. 21 or 15 in hexadecimal. So I'm just going to pop some virtual LEDs on the data bus here so we can get a good look into what's going on. And if we see that number, hex 15 pop up here in the D register and everything is working in the circuit and the computer is functional. So let's just let the clock run. And perfect. 
Sweet. I did use the magic of editing to skip over a lot of bug fixing here, but let's just be happy it worked eventually and you didn't have to suffer through hours of watching me try to debug and rewire this thing because that wouldn't have made for a very interesting video. So now, finally, to finish what we came here for and write some Pong. Well, actually, first let's try to get a screen attached to this thing. No point in running Pong if you can't see it. And, well, this is where I realized that using Logisim was a bad idea. The simulator kind of just can't keep up with driving this screen. So, to the emulator. And how about one more montage for the road? Time to give this whole software suite a real run for its money and get it to run a real program. So after a couple more days of programming, including countless bug fixes in the assembler, emulator, and circuit, with a little over 700 lines of assembly code, this is what we got. Pong, written in a custom assembly language, assembled by a custom assembler, running on a custom processor. Well, wait, emulator. Ah oh, man, I've come all this way, but what for? A custom computer architecture, yeah, but... Dear God, it still runs on the Intel processor on my Mac. This isn't enough. It's it's time to go fully off-grid. Let me just search a few things up here. Let me get some of these circuits. It's time to build this thing for real. Thanks for watching, and come back next time to watch my descent into madness as I physically assemble this thing in the next and hopefully final step on my journey to complete electronic independence. <laughs>